When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city. And he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every, and in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasures, treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, so that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, all the king's servants and all the people of the king's province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside, inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, nights or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is God's word. You may be seated. Thanks be to God. Beautiful reading, Jack. I would listen to you all day long. What a great kickoff to our day. So welcome. If you're new, welcome to Redemption Church. One of our things is we just believe the Bible to be God's written word to us as a gift. So what we do on Sundays at the center of our worship is we unpack God's word and we're going through this book of Esther. And here's sort of the question beneath the story that we've been asking along the way. And it's this, is how do you live in an assimilated and compromised culture? Esther is a Persian culture. We are in an American, Western, individualist, enlightened culture. How do you live as a faithful Christian in an assimilated and compromised culture? Here's sort of some of the options we have to grab hold of, and some of us have grabbed hold of very tightly. Here's one. Choose the political side that most aligns with how you think and just grab hold as tight as you can. We got both sides to blame for that and maybe you in this room, for thinking that's the solution to the assimilated and compromised culture. Here's another option. We just choose straight hedonism. We don't call it that. It seems too barbaric. But we eat, drink, and we be merry. We eat, we drink, we smoke, we do whatever to be merry. Or, here's what I see primarily as a pastor, to be less miserable than I am. I might not get to marry but I'm not as bad as I used to be, so I choose hedonism. Or we get successful. We chase life. We got a lot of young professionals in this room, college kids. You're on the upward of life, and everything around you is going to tell you, just keep climbing. It's where the joy is. It's where the reward is. And I can connect you to people in this room who will say, can I give you a different perspective as a Christian who's gone that route? How do you live in an assimilated and compromise culture. Here's what we believe as Christians. 
you just put your nose in this book, you ask the Spirit to give you wisdom on how you live in an assimilated and compromised culture. So what we're doing is we're looking at the book of Esther. And it's very interesting because Esther will not give us a single direct answer to any of the questions you have as a Christian in your home, in your workplace, in your schooling environment, in your dating relationships, in your singleness, in your marriage, in your ex-spouse's relationship. There will be no direct answers given to you. God's name is never mentioned, yet we're going to look at these characters and we're going to learn, we're given a story. And here's what the Spirit of God wants us to do, to get in the story and to contemplate, meditate, and learn from the characters of this story on how to live in a culture that is not our own. The new heavens and new earth will be glorious. At the core of that gloriousness is the person of Jesus. A second to that is I don't have to play the game anymore in this world. I can be who I was called to be, finally and fully. None of us are there yet. So we get in the book, and we ask God to teach us. Here's where we've been. Just Here's a catch-up of the book of Esther. You haven't met, you've missed a lot, but I'll catch you up in two minutes. Chapter 1, meet Xerxes, the king of Persia, famous historical guy, kind of a... Just a bro of bros. He likes women. He likes looking powerful. And he likes talking to his other bros. That's what he does. Chapter 1. The subtitle of chapter 1 is Where's God? It was, he was never mentioned. It's just this pompous display of Xerxes. Chapter 2. Let's see, see some new characters. You meet Mordecai and Esther, the Jews. Yet both of those names are not Jewish names. They are today because of this book. Mordecai means follower of this god, Marduk. Esther is a shout-out to a god, Ishtar. So meet the Jews, who actually look very, very, very Persian, actually. Chapter 3, X did a great job last week walking through this. It's about being in control. Haman wants the Jews destroyed. Haman and Mordecai are going to have this battle throughout the book. I picture them both being stubby, chubby, little pathetic people, like a Danny DeVito fighting a Joe Pesci. It's like, who's going to win this battle? In chapter 4... The turning point of the story. Mordecai and Esther get to respond. And Jack read it so passionately, that final speech. This is the turning point, the speech that is given that this book is known for. Just a few turning speeches in history that have stuck and stood the test of time. Winston Churchill. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and the oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence, growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. Turning point. Martin Luther King. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Not saying everything's perfect after, but that's a moment we all look to. If something happened there. My favorite movie of all time, Braveheart. The battle's about to begin, and most of the guys want to go. And William Wallace. Fight, and you may die. Run, and you'll live, at least for a little while. And dying in your beds many years from now, would you be willing to trade all the days from this day to that one for one chance, just one chance, to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. I love it. (laughs) Esther 4 is the speech. I just want to read it again. You don't have to turn there. We'll be in this book a lot. Mordecai says this. Who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this, Esther. Esther's response is as epic as William Wallace. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. That's where we're at in this story. So what I want to do is just quickly walk through this chapter, and then I want to look at it with two different lenses on, Jewish lenses and Christian lenses, and let the Spirit do what he needs to do in this room. So I want to pray and just settle our hearts in this moment. Let's bow.
Father, make this word come alive, not as a story to entertain, though it is that, but as the living, active word of God to pierce, to shape, to transform. So God, use this story, this ancient text inspired by your spirit, written down by prophets you allowed to write down your sacred word and given to us as a gift. Let the gift give today, God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So quickly, here's the chapter. I'm going to have it on. Here's the first part. Three parts. We're going to just skim through it. We're going to spend most of our time just asking, what does this mean for Jews? What does this mean for Christians? So the first part is one through three. Let's read it together. This sort of sets the stage. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city, and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes." Mordecai responds. What's his response? Fasting, sackcloth, that's weird. It's like the old uh, potato sack races. It's you take off your clothes, you put that on. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. So your body feels the way your soul feels. This is uncomfortable. What's uncomfortable? The Jews are going to be eliminated. It's Hitler's on the rise. Oh, no. Before there was a Hitler. So he's mourning and he's fasting. And just so you know, to give him a little bit of credit here, he's poking his head out as a Jewish man for the first time in this book. This is not the way it should be. So he's mourning and he's fasting and he's weeping and he's crying because the Jews are going to be eliminated if something doesn't happen. Keep reading. 4 through 11 now. And when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Let's stop right there. So it gets word to Esther, who's also a Jew. She's distressed. Her response is, here's a fresh set of clothes. Here's some milk. Stop this, please. You're making a scene. Let's keep reading. Then Esther called for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed to a tender, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in the front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him, to the detail, the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. There's the issue. Verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her and command her to go to the king and beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathak went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say this. So here's Esther's response to her family member, her adoptive father, All the king's servants and all the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he might live. But as for me, I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. I can't go. She's the queen. But unless he holds this out, this invitation, I count. And it's been a month since he's called her in. Which just reminds you of the character of Xerxes. This is his wife. It's been 30 days since he spent time with her. Why? Because he's got the whole kingdom of women to choose from. Esther's like, I can't do anything. Let's keep reading. What's going to be the response to this? Verse 12. Here's the turning point of it all. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Again, this is back and forth through messengers. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's place you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink 
for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also go fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered. Such a beautiful story. God's name is still not mentioned. There's no direct, so what? Here's the application, Jew or Christian. It's just a story given to us. Why? God wants us to meditate, contemplate, and sit with these characters and let the Spirit give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at this as a Jewish person. I want to put on some Jewish lenses and just see the beauty of the Jewish faith, the Jewish story. Because that's what we see. We see part of what makes the Jewish faith so beautiful in this, especially as we look at the person of Mordecai. So let's just look at Mordecai for a second. Here's the first thing I want to remember about Mordecai, is the Jews have a story. What's beautiful about being Jewish? They have this story. Every Saturday, I have baseball in the same part of town, Central Phoenix, and I drive past, and all of my Jewish friends, they're not, they're not friends with me yet, but I'd be friends with them if we talked, or walk in the streets. What ties them together? This unified, historical story. God called Abraham and said, you're going to go from this comfortable living you have to another land. And if you do, I am going to bless you. And you're, look at the stars, Abraham. Can you count the stars? Nope, that'll be your descendants. And that's the start of the Jewish faith. And then you walk through the story of Genesis and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, this beautiful, rich, not perfect, holy, or righteous story, but faithful story from God's perspective where he holds on to the Jews. And then you get out of Genesis and Joseph is gone and now they're in this foreign land, Egypt. And Moses rises up by the hand of God to lead them. How is he going to lead them? We need more than just an ethnic thing connecting us. We need a center. What's our center going to be? The Torah, the law. Here's how the people of God should act. Now they have a constitution, you could say. This is how we're going to act. And Moses leads them out. And you follow the story through Joshua and Judges and then the kings, David and Solomon, and even the divided kingdom. It's this story that God is faithful to his promises, and they have it. And this book of Esther is at the tail end of the divided kingdom, but it's still the same story that traces back to Abraham. That is beautiful. Beautiful. They have a story. But they have more than just a story. They have this rich, I'll call it an unbreakable Community. Let's read verse 15 and 16 together. This is the tail end of it. What's the so what? What are we going to do about this? Esther told them to go to Mordecai and do what? Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Like what a picture. In a foreign land, I've never lived in a place foreign to me. But to think they're in a foreign land with the king and the kingdom and the empire against them, and they have their people to rally around them through fasting and solemnness and sackcloth and ashes. It's just a beautiful picture of the community that is the Jewish faith. And just as I look at our church and think about us, some of you have very deep, rich family communities. And that's a beautiful thing. A lot of us don't. Some of you have great, great work environments that provide your community. Me and Xavier are figuring out if we do. (laughs) Some of you, a lot of you, your story is you found great community here. It's not all of you yet. But like what this church is to you is this moment where there's crisis and they're around you and you have community. That is beautiful. And maybe no other group in all the world outside of Christians, the Jews represent the beautiful reality of an unbreakable community. And we see that in Mordecai. They have a story, they have a community, and they also have a promise that was first whispered then spoken a little louder, and it just got louder as the Old Testament went on. And we see Mordecai mention it, verse 14. 
Let's read chapter 4, verse 14. What's the promise that he's standing on as a Jew here? For if you keep silent at this time, talking to his niece, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. God is going to fix this. Esther, you can be involved in this story or you can punt on your heritage and you and your father's house will perish. Her father's already dead. What he's saying is spiritually, the connection you have to the people of God, which connects you to the promises of God, will go away. But God's going to fix this. There is a promise to the Jewish people. They have this beautiful story, a beautiful community. The book of Romans, there's an interesting little tidbit in the beginning. Paul's basically just blasting everyone. Sinner, sinner. It's like whack-a-mole. Everyone's a sinner. The Jews are like, what about us? Sinner. <laughs> well, what's, what's the point of being Jewish then? And he says this. It's on the screen. What good is it to be a Jew? Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of our circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. They were given the promises of God first to hold and to steward. And then they were given to the Jewish Messiah. It's a good thing. Now, here's what I want to, I prayed a lot about this message because I'm going to be very clear and direct. These are all good things. And a lot of that, what I mentioned, is what people are craving right now. A story that is transcendent. A community that is deep and connected and crosses boundaries. People are sick of political discussion. People want connection to something deeper, more substantial. And they want tradition and history. And here's the other thing people are starting to want. Morality, or at least somebody talking about what is right and what is wrong. That is our cultural moment in this God-forsaken culture that has pushed God to the side. They want truth, a story, a community. Where are they going to get it? Oh, come on. (laughs) Here's a sense I'm getting. I meet with a decent amount of people. It's become a regular thing in my pastoral. Who are converting to Catholicism, Anglicanism, other church traditions, which I'm not here to throw shade. But a lot of the reason is I want a deep tie to the history. I want to be rooted into something bigger than myself. I'm sick of being this little island on an island of a bunch of other islands of individuals. I want to be connected to something beautiful. And here's what I can say. The Jewish faith offers that more than anything else maybe you could find. So if you're looking for a story a community, the Jewish faith is your option. I want to be connected to something bigger. However, 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 people are looking for a story, a community, and a promise. We need to have a hero of the story. And there's no hero in Esther. We need to have a center of our community. We can't just rally around principles or ideas or what we're against. We need a person at the center of our community. And we don't just need promises. We need fulfillment of promises. And all the kids with parents who overpromise say yes and amen. That's why if you read this with Jewish lens on, it's a beautiful, rich story. But if you keep Jewish lens on while you read the book of Esther, you miss everything. You grab hold of some beautiful, neat realities, but you miss everything. What do the Jews need and what do we still need? It says here, relief and deliverance. Where are you going to find relief and deliverance in a world that is hostile, in a heart of yours that is sinful, Where are you going to find it? Here's what I want to do. I want to put on some Christian glasses, and I want to read the rest of the story and just remind the Christians of the room of the beauty we have in Jesus and encourage 
non-Christians in this room to follow Jesus, maybe for the first time. So what is the incompleteness of this Jewish story? Let's just read it again. It's going to be overkill, but I want it in our bones. Let's read verse 12 through 16 again. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief, deliverance will rise up for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa. Hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. And I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. If you only have a Jewish framework, you miss a whole lot. Like you miss the essence of the Bible. You miss the gospel. It's like this. My wife is an, I'll call her an intense puzzler. Like she gets that crazy look in her eyes and she's like, it's go time. It's puzzle time. She gets her puzzle out. And one of my kids, I won't say who, has this thing that is just wrong. But when he sees it, he's like, all right, mom's in the zone. He takes one puzzle. He doesn't tell her. Put one puzzle piece and he hides it. So she's like, just, just killing it. And she gets to the end. How frustrating. Like, you want to punch my kid. I want to punch my kid. She wants to punch her kid. If you don't read Jesus into Esther, you've got like this puzzle, and it's like something's missing. It's not done yet. And here's what it is is Esther gives us both a picture of what salvation is, and she also gives us a picture of how we get to that salvation. A picture of what salvation is and a picture of how we get to that salvation. So first I want to walk through, how do you experience salvation? How do you walk out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? How do you experience salvation? Now remember, just a backstory. Esther is a Jew, Yet nothing about her Jewishness is out until the line where it says, Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Up until that moment, remember, her name could be Hadassah, which is like Myrtle Tree Righteousness, or Esther, Persian Lady. Which one are you going to be? The whole story, she's kind of put this on the shelf, I'm going to be the Ishtar person, Ishtar person, Ishtar person. Even in this chapter, she hangs out in that camp a little too long. Verse 4, go to chapter 4, verse 4. It's her attempt to stuff her Jewishness and stuff her uncle's Jewishness. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai and what he was doing, The queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. What was her answer to this dilemma? Cover that up. Hide it. Stuff that Jewishness. In our context, it's I want to live the way of the world. The Christian stuff, no. I don't want to do this. I want to do this. Yet, at the very end, she gives a glimmer of hope. That she's not the heroine yet, but she's doing something well. She says, well, then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. This whole story of Esther turns on this moment. Turns on what moment? When Esther says, if I have to die, I'll die. And she turns, she starts the turn away from the Persianness, back towards faithfulness to being a Jew. What's it called when you're walking a direction and you turn... In biblical Christianity, it's called repentance. You turn around. Re, 180, Pensy's thoughts. Rethink. Jesus' first sermon was one sentence. He comes on the scene. He says, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Turn around. Another way to say it is, put to death your old life. Come and follow me. How does anyone in this room become a Christian? This is not the sexy answer, but it's the faithful answer. It's you put to death 
everything about your life. And you walk the other direction. That's how. Here's sort of a walkthrough of ways I think people assume they become Christian or are Christian. Just how do I become a Christian? Here's the first answer. By birth. There's nothing in my genetic code and Aubrey's genetic code that gets passed on as we have our four sons that they now come out as Christians. You are not born a Christian. Let's start with that. Next one. By relational connection. Well, my mom's a Christian. My favorite uncle's a Christian. I did a whole lot of young life. Great, great, great. None of that leads you to put to death a life and turn around and follow Jesus. So your relational connections mean nothing. Next. By church attendance. You're like, wow, you were trying to kill this church? <laughs> this is sort of ingrained in Catholics and people like me that grew up. It's like, how do you know you're like a good religious person? I went to church. And then people actually make you do the math and you're like crumbling. Well, I only went twice last year. Well, I'll go six times. And that makes, you could be in here 24-7 waiting for Chandler to turn the lights on on Sunday morning. And you're still not a Christian. Next one. By doing, let's just ramp it up. Well, I'm going to start giving. We've got this great formation plan. I'm fasting. I'm Sabbathing. I'm doing all the things. Great, however, incomplete. And incapable to transform a dead heart to a living heart that beats for Jesus. Next one. By default, this is my favorite. Like, you talk to people, what, what are you? It's like the mental checklist. I'm not Muslim, not Mormon. <laughs> I'm not an atheist. I'm I, I, Christian. Like, when you meet Jesus one day face to face, when you're dead and gone and you face him, there's no option of, well, you were like the last thing, so well done, good and faithful checkboxer. Enter in. But that's like the default answer. And we live in a conservative-ish enough state still to where Christianity is still not totally hated on, so that's, like, that's becoming less and less of the option. Here's another one. This is the ultimate church one. By worthiness. How do you get into the kingdom of God? By being worthy. That's the Mormon answer. And the Mormons are smart enough, and Joseph Smith was smart enough to know, nobody's worthy enough, so what do you got to do? Well, let's make heaven layered. So I'm like, well, what heaven am I going to get into? Well, I'm not the top, because I'm not, you know, the greatest, but the third, maybe. The kingdom of God is a flat ground. And Jesus welcomes all into the same level same kingdom, same relationship. Our worthiness does not get us anywhere in God's sight. It's filthy rags. So what is the answer? How does one become a Christian? Here's my two-word answer, by death. Your death and his death. Your current death while you have time to choose and his death that he chose for you. If I perish, I perish. The Christian answer is, I must perish to enter the kingdom of God. This is why I went through Turkey years ago. All the like ancient baptismals, which is like a centerpiece of the faith, are shaped like one of two things. The woman's body, picturing new birth, or graves. Why? What does it mean to become a Christian? It's new birth in the spirit, and at the same time, it's death to that which you were and would be apart from the grace of Jesus. Have you turned to Jesus? That's my question. Have you? I don't care how many times you've missed church. I don't care that you looked at pornography last night. I don't care that everyone closest to you knows what a sham you are. I don't care what any horizontal reality is. I care about what the Bible says and what Esther paints a picture of. 
Death is at the center of how you become a Christian. Your death based on his death. Will you turn to him? We did not plant this church to have great singing and worship. We planted this church to change lives by the power of the Spirit. And at the start of that for each individual is an encounter with Jesus Christ. And you don't checkbox your way into that. You die your way into that. You repent. You turn around in this moment. If you have never done that, now is your chance. I repent. And it's going to feel weird and incomplete because it's both of those. But you need to have a moment where you say, I'm turning. Like you're looking at a pastor of four kids who listens to this all the time. And I have to have these conversations with them. Like you don't get in on my coattails, boys. You don't get in on your mom's quiet times, sons. You don't get in on anything that any of us have done. You get in when you in your own soul turn to him who gives life and life abundantly. Have you done that? If you haven't, do it. Hebrews says, today is the day of salvation. Here's two just practical things. Repent. That's at the center. But then tell someone, I think I repented today. And tell someone who's not a turd and going to pick at you for it. <laughs> Tell a Chandler Cruz who will give you the biggest hug. Teenagers in this room, have you repented? I have this talk with my oldest all the time. Is this a boy moment or a man moment? Because I'll let you play the boy game, but then I have to treat you like a dad treats a boy. Or do you want to talk like a man and want to step into this man moment? At every moment, all of us have to face this and say, what's my decision? Repent and believe. Here's the other thing, and this is what Christians have done since it all started. Have you been baptized? Here's my encouragement. Sign up to be baptized. Get baptized. Because it's a picture of death and new life. Death, the grave, new life, birth that you didn't earn, but the grace of the Spirit is in you and gave it to you. Have you done that yet? If not, do it. Talk to me after. If I perish, I perish. To become a Christian, you have to perish. That's how you become a Christian. But here's the beautiful reality of being a Christian. Here's why Esther, if you read it as a Jew, you miss. Here's what true salvation looks like. We don't follow someone who says, if I perish, I perish. Here's what Jesus said all over the New Testament. In almost every discussion he has with his disciples, he talks about his death that he chose. Do we have it there? This is him. He had this conversation, my guess would be about 14,000 times, and they didn't get it. He strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised again. Jesus chose death that we deserve. Jesus chose torture. Jesus chose a cross. Jesus chose that which none of us want to take on ourselves. And it wasn't an if, it was when this happens. This is what Christians stand on, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Reading Esther as a Jew, it's beautiful. But I want to point out one more thing. Here's the problem in this chapter. The last chapter was the Jews are going to be eliminated. In this chapter, they're dealing with that reality. And here's the problem both Mordecai and Esther fall into, and it's the problem that Jesus has solved for all of us. Go to chapter 4, verse 2. Here's Mordecai's problem in chapter 4. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. Their problem of being eliminated is a major problem. Their current problem is they don't have access to the king who can fix their problem. Go to verse 11. Esther, who's queen, who's as close to the king as you can be, says she has the same problem. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law. To be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he might live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king in these past 30 days. What is their problem? 
they're going to be eliminated. What's their current problem? There's no access to the king. That is the Christian problem that has been solved in Jesus. Sin has introduced death, destruction, catastrophe, and there's one person who can fix this, and he has blocked access to all of us left to ourselves. My favorite kid's book of all time, The Garden, The Curtain, and The Cross. Because of our sin, we can't come in. 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 What's the picture as the New Testament shows up of that reality? It's the temple, and there's still a curtain saying, God is in here. Sinful man is out there. And in the Gospels, it says Jesus was killed on the cross. He took his last breath. It is finished and died. And the curtain was torn. And now the problem that Esther and Mordecai experience in this, no access to the king, becomes a thing of the past for those who have trusted in Jesus. Christians, here's what I want to remind you of. We don't have this same problem. We have complete, personal, eternal, intimate access to the king of the universe. So no matter what problem we're facing, in a world that is dark and seems godless, we have God. Not because of what I've done or you've done, but because of the blood of Jesus that was shed. Amen? Amen. Here's Joel, the prophet. I want to read his words to you one more time, just as a reminder of what this morning should mean to some of you. Here's God's heart. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the beautiful Jewish story that is the book of Esther, of this community that's been unbreakable because of a faithful God. And God, thank you for the rest of the story that allows us to read this in its fullness, that Esther was simply a picture, a shadow, a whisper towards that which we all long for. Access to the king once and for all. Relief and deliverance once and for all. And God, for those in this room, I pray that your spirit would be telling them what Joel told us hundreds of years ago, to return, to repent, for the Lord is good and gracious. God, we love you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.